Today we'll be talking about temptations. Temptations. Let's go to James 1, please. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. There are two aspects within temptations. It's the negative and the positive. The negative is that it's not in God. The negative is that it's not in God. Quite often, we're too easy to blame God whenever temptations happen. However, there are some verses that seem to show that God does tempt people. The Bible makes it clear, however, that God does not. So we're going to look at these contradictions and then find the explanation. James 1, verse 13. The Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But this seems to contradict Genesis 22, 1. Go to Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. Notice the Bible clearly says here that God did tempt Abraham. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. When Abraham was offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice, the word of God actually uses the word tempt. <clears throat> and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. So then what's the answer here? Well, when you look at James 1 again, in verse 13, the key is the Lord does not cause you to do evil. The Lord doesn't cause you to do evil. He is not the one who is directly making you or leading you or causing you to sin. That's not in God's nature. He doesn't want you, he doesn't want to do, he wants, ugh, I lost the words, he does not want to do with anything with evil, if, that, if that's good English. James 1.13, let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted with God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So evil has nothing to do with God. He doesn't cause you to do evil. What he does, however, is he tests you. When people look, at the word, uh, look up the word tempt, tempt is another word for test. If you go backwards at James chapter 1, <clears throat> and then look at verse 12, like the verse behind it. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, see that? So that's the context of testing. He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now, if you go, if you continually go backward, it has to do with trying, testing. Verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, see that? If you look at verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. What's the idea here? James is not covering temptation in the sense of relation to sin, but also the trials that we go through. That's what the testing is. The testing, it's the trial. That's what Genesis 22 points out. Genesis 22, it points out that God tests us. So in 2 Samuel 24, look at these several cases here. 2 Samuel 24. God, he doesn't tempt you with sin. What he does is that he tests your character to see the good within you. He's not trying to make you do evil. That's the devil's purpose. Now, uh, if you look at the screen here, I like how this chart demonstrates the difference with testing and temptation. You'll notice that testing seeks to reveal the person's moral qualities or character and move them into conformity with the nature of Christ. But temptation, it deceives you. It can even corrupt and ruin you. It deceives you. That's what temptation does. It deceives you. But testing seeks to undeceive, if that makes any sense. What it seeks to do is to sh expose the deception, the error, and to show the genuineness, the truthfulness, the real parts in you that you need to see, but you didn't want to see. But deception is pretending that those ugly things don't exist, right? 
That's why testing is important. It aims at the person's good. This one, it aims at leading the person away from the Lord. It's the work of God. That's what te testing is. Temptation is the work of the devil. So that chart, I think, uh, demonstrates it really well, the difference with those two. Uh, let's look at 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Giz Israel. Notice, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Notice how this matches with 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21. And we'll look at verse 1. 1 Chronicles 21. And we'll look at verse 1. Satan is the one that made David count the number of the children of Israel, which is forbidden in Scripture. Since it's forbidden in Scripture, we see here that the devil is doing the work of temptation. 1 Chronicles 21.1, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, do you see the difference here? If you compare Samuel and Chronicles, the Bible shows that God moved. Over here, it says Satan provoked. So the wording here is very different. You see temptation. You see deception. You see the context of sin here with Satan stirring in David's heart, provoking him. That's the wording. But then you see God moving. What he's doing is that he's trying He's testing. He's trying to get David to see if he's going to pass the test. Job 1 is the key here, Job 1. Notice that God is the one who allows the devil to do the temptation. He allows Satan to ruin your life. And the reason why is for his purpose, it's a test. The devil's purpose is to make sure you fall. Job chapter 1, we'll look at verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Notice in verse 11, Satan challenges God. So God, Satan says, the only reason why Job is living right for you is because you blessed him. So God has to prove that Job's integrity is still in there without the blessing. That's why God had to test Job by taking away the blessings in his life. And in order to do that, he uses Satan to tempt Job, to provoke Job, to try to get Job to sin. Verse 11, Satan says to God, He'll curse your face if you allow all these bad things to happen. And then verse 12, God gives Satan permission to do it. This is why when you look at the book of Samuel and Chronicles, when David was moved or provoked to number the children of Israel, the Bible says God's the one that stirred David's heart, whereas the other passage says Satan stirred David's heart. Well, then who is it? Which one is it? It's God who allowed the devil to do that to David. That's the idea. That's why God still uh, takes the credit, takes accountability, responsibility. Even though he has nothing to do with evil, even though he's not the cause of evil. Why? Because Satan can't tempt you without God's permission. So when God grants him permission, then the devil is able to do his work on you. Let's go to Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. And then we'll look at verse 1, Matthew chapter 4. And then we'll read verse 1. The positive, the positive. So where does temptation come from? So we're talking about the source of temptations. The negative, it's not in God. Positive, four areas. Matthew 4, 1, Satan. 
Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Second one is the flesh. Go to James 1. James 1. The flesh. Notice that sin comes from the flesh. Lust is from the flesh. James 1.14 but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. We're going to look at Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. The third one is the world. The world. The world's the one responsible for opening up temptation and sin to you. Proverbs 1, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Notice right here that these people in the world, worldly people, sinners, that they're the one who can tempt you. Now, the last one might be surprising to you. Go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. You know who also tempts you to sin? Saved Christians. Saved believers can get you to sin as well. They can tempt you. Go to Matthew chapter 16 and we'll look at verse 22. Notice who was the one who tried to tempt Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ rebuked that individual. But it was Satan who was tempting Jesus, but he used a saved believer to do that. Matthew 16, 22. Then Jesus took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be, uh, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now notice what Jesus did, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. See, that's Satan working in a saved believer, trying to tempt him. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Let's go to James 1, James chapter 1. Now, a problem with a lot of people in churches today and in our world today and even online is how gullible they are because they see some pastor or some Christian who, see, who shows the love of Jesus Christ and everything, that, oh, he can't be wrong. And then whatever he says, they don't realize that that false pastor is misleading them, tempting them to believe in a wrong doctrine or to apply a wrong principle in their everyday Christian living. Do you know how many people are deceived because of tempters out there who show the love of Jesus Christ? Say believers. The world's very gullible. The world's very gullible. It's all a show. That's the thing. Anyone can put on a show. The devil puts on a show, right? As an angel of light. His ministers as ministers of righteousness. That's something that people don't think. Now, James 1, verse 2. There are two reasons for temptations. Now, let's talk about the reasons for temptations. There are two reasons for temptations. <coughs> It is a test of our faith and a test of obedience. Those are the two, reason, uh, two reasons. James chapter 1 and verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. So why are we supposed to be happy? That's what the author James argues, that we can be happy. Because it's to test our faith. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh. Patience. Now go to Genesis 22. We already read that, so if you don't want to turn there, that's fine, but write it down. Genesis 22, 1, it's a test of obedience. Remember Abraham, the Bible says that the Lord tempted him, meaning that he's testing him. Why? Because God wants to see if Abraham will really obey him, that he will sacrifice his son Isaac. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. So see right here, it says God tempt. With what? Verse 2, sacrifice your son Isaac. Now those are the two reasons for temptations. He's trying to test your faith. And he's trying to test if you're really going to obey what he said. Now look at 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're 
We're going to talk about one really helpful area, and that is the limit of temptations. The limit of temptations. You want to mark down 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. That is one of the best verses in the Bible regarding temptation. It is a verse that should be memorized. I know a lot of people, it is one of their favorite verses. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a wonderful promise. It is a wonderful truth, and it is an eye-opener, sobering thought. When you go through the lust, and then it seems to be unbearable, and then you can't take it anymore. And this verse is the one that you want to claim. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. One, he sets the time limit. God promised he'll set a time limit. Temptation is, that temptation doesn't go on forever. Some people think it is, but that's not the case. The Lord, he puts a time limit on it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Now, when he says that, also make a way to escape, and that means it's not going to stick to you forever. That means that there is a limit on that. So when the devil comes in and torments and tempts you, he can only do it for a season. He can only do it uh, for a time limit. The thing is how well you're using the time limit. You say, well, I can't take it anymore. I want to yield to temptation and sin. We'll just hold on a little longer. I mean, you're not tempted to do the sin right now, for example, right? See, there's always scenarios in your life where you don't fall into temptation because there's a time limit on everything. You just got to hold on. Just got to bear it a little longer. Now, another one is God sets the timing of temptation, not just the time limit, but he puts it at the right time. He puts it at the right time. He allows these sins and temptations to happen in our life when we're mature enough to withstand the particular type of temptation. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is what? Common to man. So see, he makes sure that the sin and temptations are something that's common to you that will be common to everybody. Also, it says right here that will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, meaning he's not going to allow a temptation to happen in your life that you cannot stand. Now, a great example is when you got saved. When you got saved and you became a Bible believer, all of a sudden bad things started happening, right? <laughs> and then you're like, well, this didn't happen before to me. Before I got saved, why is it happening now? Because now you're at a much more mature point as a saved believer to see these uh, bad things happening to you and you have the knowledge now. You have the church now. You have the Bible now. You have the Holy Spirit in you now where you can handle those situations, those temptations. Another example is when you pass the temptations, when you pass the test. You think you're done, right? But you're not done. Then a new temptation happens, right? Why does that new temptation happen? Because God now sees that you're mature enough to handle the next level. But he didn't give you that next level until you passed your first test, your first temptation, correct? Now, some of you, if you're moaning and groaning about your temptation right now, you, bet, you just better thank God he didn't put you on the next level. Now, there are plenty of Christians out there, say believers out there, missionaries especially out there, who are going through a lot worse than you and I. But it, thank God that God didn't put those things upon our lives. Because he knows what our limitation is. Now, the temptation that you and I are going through is something that you and I are mature enough to handle. You have the knowledge you have the word of God. You know what to do. You got the Holy Spirit. The problem is we're just flesh and we don't want to do it. 
The third thing is the stress or amount of pressure. When you look at verse 13, he gave a promise he will guide the stress and the amount of pressure during the temptation. That's the third promise he gave you. In other words, you will have enough of the strength to bear the stress. He never promised a stress relief. Do you understand? He never promised a stress relief. What he promised you is the strength to bear the stress. So he promised to guide the stress or the amount of pressure during the actual temptation. He also provides also the relief for the stress. Like I said before, he gives you the strength to bear through the stress. But also, he gives you the relief because he didn't give you the harder temptation that your stress is not able to bear. So in that sense, that is a relief to you. If we were to go to verse 13, the last part, <clears throat> but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So it is something that you can put up. It is something that you can ha handle. So in that middle of the temptation that you and I are feeling, God is guiding the stress level. And even though you think that your health is falling apart, you got to realize this. Every addict says the same thing too. But you can handle it. You can overcome it. People smoke marijuana because their number one medical reason is pain. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Even though marijuana boasts all the other benefits, that's what the marijuana advocates are doing, you know, like AIDS or... <clears throat> mental issues and all that other stuff. But isn't it funny when you look at stats, national surveys, that the number one reason 90% of people smoke marijuana is for the reason of pain, not the, all these other tons of benefits. So in other words, all these 20 or 100 medical benefits that marijuana advocates claim is only 5% or less. <laughs> well, whereas 95% is what they claim pain. But addiction psychiatrists will tell you that's the number one excuse of addiction clients and patients. And unfortunately, let's be honest, that's the excuse of us Christians. We keep claiming we're in pain, we can't handle it, we're in pain, we're in pain, we're in pain. No, 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 no. The, uh, you can't handle it. Problem is you don't want to handle it. You do have the strength, you just, and God is guiding the stress or the amount of pressure. You just don't want to use it. You just don't want to feel it because who loves pain? No one does. Uh, we're going to look at Proverbs 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Now we're going to come across the methods of temptation. The methods of temptation. There are four methods that will cause temptations and you cannot allow these things to happen. If these things happen to you, this is very bad. That's why you're going to keep repeating the same bad habits. Now, I'm not being a liberal here, but there is a truth. Do you know why there's uh, so much crime going on and uh, there's an increasing rate of poverty? We could easily say that it's because people are lazy, uh, but, that's, but there's a reason why here. When people are born from poverty, the temptation is much more easy. You, you, you know why? Because drugs are cheaper to buy. You can go off of government benefits and then get something cheap to feel something. Poverty is a huge method that the devil uses where people get stuck on sin, temptation. You got to realize that. So you have to be careful when you're in a, a poverty situation. That's why I believe in hard work. That's why I believe in taking care of your household. That's, uh, I mean, if you go through poverty and that's the Lord's will, then fine, because God puts us in all kinds of situations in life. But be careful where the situation doesn't become so poverty stricken that temptation and easy way outs that lead to sin become very attractive. That's extremely dangerous, okay? So when you go to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 9, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and what? And steal, and take the name of my God in vain. 
I mean, rich people aren't going to steal. You know why? Because they got the dough to buy it. But poor people, of course, they're going to steal if they want an item. All right, let's uh, look at Proverbs 30, verse 9 again. The same verse. You know what's another method of temptation? Prosperity. Riches will get you to sin easily. So you may not be poor, and you may not be like wealthy rich, but let's be honest, if you live in America, you are rich. You can get, you have too much stuff. That's just simple, okay? If you have too much stuff, then you're rich. And all that stuff, all that junk is preventing you from serving God. All that junk is making you more soft. All that junk is making you more comfortable. And because of that, temptation is more alluring. It's more easy to commit. Proverbs 30, verse 9, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Uh, you know why people go to uh, bars, why people get into fornication, why kids, when they get into college, they land in sin and stuff like that? Because somebody had enough dough to make them live that way. That's why you wonder why your next generation is getting more spoiled, because you're spoiling them. They don't know meaning of hard work. They weren't exposed to that. They never took care of other people. All they was was they were cared for themselves by parents who gave them so much love. That's a dangerous thing. That's an extremely dangerous thing. You need to get your kids exposed to work, to hardship, and to uh, care for other people. That's the number one factor. That's why a lot of criminals end up where they are because psychologists will admit this, they lack empathy. Well, why don't you get them into a Bible-believing church? Why don't you get them to participate in church activities? That's a great opportunity where you're, where you're, where you're experiencing and doing things of empathy toward other people. You know, it's really sad, but uh, I wanted a teenage Bible-believing ministry going. It, uh, Lord didn't really bless it or it didn't really fall through, but... You know, what I wanted to do eventually was for the teenagers where they grow in knowledge of the Lord and they start teaching younger kids. Amen. Have them uh, teach the younger kids in the Sunday school class. You know why? It'll get them to get out of themselves. Teenagers, it's very dangerous because the hormones and everything, it's more easy to fall into self-flesh. So when they start to do practices of empathy toward uh, younger kids, it'll help them get out of that. It'll help them understand why grown adults do the things that they do, rather than always critiquing and complaining what grown adults do. Well, anyway, anyway, I, I'm, I'm off track, you know, so go to Numbers 22. Probably meant nothing. All right, so <laughs> Numbers 22. Numbers 22. We'll look at verse 17. Numbers 22, 17. Uh, uh, let me, uh, but let me just add this, especially when you're raising kids, because we're getting babies here, okay? Don't you dare make the same mistake every liberal is doing by keep showing them love and giving them the best. That's so dangerous. Don't do that. Now, uh, why, why am I saying that? Because you're turning them into a spoil mentality where they're going to keep asking you, requesting, demanding you to keep giving them the best. That's so dangerous. Don't do that, okay? So why do we have disciplinary measures in this class? Why do we have Sunday school? Why do we have rules? Why do we do that? Because they need to learn not to just have a give me attitude. They need to learn to give something to us. If they do that, they're going to learn to be more grateful. Now, don't get me wrong. We live in a messed up world where kids are not shown enough love by grown adults. But do you know why those grown adults? Adults are not giving enough love to their kids because they were raised by their parents of a give me attitude. And that's why those adults are not giving enough love to their kids. There's the answer. Okay, you want to solve crime, poverty, all this mess? Start giving to other people. Aren't you a liberal? <laughs> Christians are more liberal than the liberals. Funny, ain't it? Numbers 22, verse 17. And they want to shut down churches. That's what these liberals do. They look down on Christians for acts of what they're doing to help out other people. Ain't that something? That's wicked, sent from hell. All right, Numbers 22, verse 17. I'm not going to go on the spiel here. Okay. 
For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. Worldly glory, see? That's why Balaam fell into temptation here. He was offered worldly glory. Nothing like it for Christians to start backsliding, then they get a better job opportunity. Nothing like it where young people mess up in their life because of a loving relationship. I've seen too many of that. It's, uh, they want that uh, acceptance from the world, see? All right, let's look at Numbers, uh, 1 Kings 19.4. 1 Kings 19.4. Fourth method. Get this, okay? Now, this is probably the number one factor in our church. Ready? Discouragement. And why you keep messing up in sin? You just get easily discouraged. So I believe that uh, if you mess up, just clean it up and come back. I mean, unless it has such a negative effect that it ruins the public testimony or it's a danger or a hazard to other members, that's one thing. But one thing I noticed what's common to everybody is that they make the same mistakes everybody is doing and you just repent, get down to the blood and come back. That's it. So 1 Kings 19 verse 4 but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. <laughs> Why did Elijah uh, yield to the temptation of suicide? Because he got so discouraged. You keep yielding to the same temptation and sin because you get discouraged and you go, what's the point of it? I'm going to mess up anyway, right? Now go to Job 2. Job 2. We're going to talk about the types of temptation. The types of temptation. Now we're not going to look through all of these verses, but uh, you probably want to write them down. The first one is to unbelief. To unbelief. That's Job 2 verse 9. You'll notice that's the devil's purpose, is to try to make temptation very strong for you. That you're going to doubt God's promises. You're going to doubt God's work upon your life. So when you come across this crossroads in your life, it's either a path that you're going to uh, tame that thing, or you're going to fall into temptation and sin. So here are the many types of temptation that you want to avoid. To unbelief, Job 2 verse 9. To presumption, that's the second one. To presumption, Matthew 4 verse 6. Matthew chapter 4 verse 6. Uh, you'll notice that the devil tried to use that on Jesus Christ. Do you know how many Bible-believing pastors, ministers, fall into this trap? Uh, because everybody presumes, assumes things. When you do that, that's extremely dangerous. You can pastor or judge or preach or advise something wrongly if you're not careful. That's extremely dangerous. The third one is to worship Satan. Worship Satan. Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. Now, you may not find that temptation attractive now, but trust me, if you give it time or you'd go through the doom and gloom, you'd be surprised how many people can fall into that. Or you might if you're not careful. Now Daniel chapter 4 verse 30. Daniel 4 verse 30 is the fourth temptation is pride. Pride. The fifth one is pleasure. Pleasure. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. Uh, that's what everybody wants now, is to be pleased. That's why drugs are there. Acts chap uh, The sixth one is power. Power. Acts chapter 8, verse 19. Acts chapter 8 and verse 19. Seventh is society. Society. Genesis chapter 19, verse 24 through 26. Genesis 19, verse 24 through 26. Uh, you'll notice that concerning power, it's about Holy Ghost power here. And then that was even a temptation to sin. A lot of times, say, believers, if you're not careful, when you say you want the filling power of the Spirit, great, wonderful, I want that too. 
but it's more so because you want power in your life. And if you're not careful, then you're going to always aim for that hype and then get out of the will of God. Society, in that case, Lot, he was uh, bent toward the ways of the world, what society wanted. So he tried to get the job like everybody else does, settle down like everybody else does. Now, one thing I really hate about this place is how this culture does affect everyone here. And I mean that. I can see it affecting me. So I really hate that. That's the reason why we get discouraged easily. We get a victimization mentality very easily. We complain. We critique easily. We don't work hard very easily. We lack common sense, to be honest. Okay? I really believe in that. That's the reason why I uh, would tell some of our laborers here, like, we got to up our game here a bit. So, because when we compare, and some of you saw it, right, when you compare yourself to other churches that you've seen? See, we, get, we have a bad culture here that did affect us, and when we go to other churches, we kind of open our eyes a bit and realize, wow, there's, they can do this, they do that, and what am I doing? You know what I mean? So, that's the reason why this traveling thing was good. Campaigns was good, right? Amen. To have iron sharpeneth iron conference right? This, this kind of stuff is good for us because we cannot keep seeing these people here. We got to see good people out there, a good society that influenced us, kind of open our eyes a bit. And anyway, uh, possessions, that's the eighth one. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1. Too much stuff, then uh, you're going to mess up, right? Or you want more stuff, that's the greedy American there. Sex, sex. That's Nehemiah 13, verse 26. Nehemiah 13, verse 26. 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 4. 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 4. Uh, I want to give a warning here. This is the uh, number one sin that I've seen with teenagers and young adults. And get out of church completely, especially in this place. You know why everyone shacks up in here? So you got to be very careful of that. This is a huge sin that is with uh, teenagers and young adults. The tenth one is money. Money. That's John chapter 13, verse 21 through 30. John chapter 13, verse 21 through 30. American life, right? Money, money, money. Uh, I hate to say this, but uh, now this is not to say about anybody who moved out of our church, okay? But what's very important is if you want to move out of this church because of higher pay, see that? you got to ask yourself, is this a temptation that I'm yielding to? Okay, the last one, 11th one, is false humility. Ain't that surprising? False humility. That's Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. And Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 through 14. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 through 14. When you're asked upon, hey, can you do this for our church? Maybe sing or preach or help out the nursery or do witnessing or do this and that, you know, are you going to say, well, no, I'm just not capable. You know, I'm just so stupid. I'm just a wretch. And, you know, when you're saying all that, uh, those type of people, it's easy for them to be humble in the Lord, which is a good thing. They never get prideful. But the devil uses that where it's a false humility, and you get nothing done for the Lord because all you think is you're a worthless wreck. So you got to have confidence in there. You can't just keep doubting yourself and, because then you're doubting God's power working on your life. All right? That, and that's a temptation. That's a sin. You're not humble. That's a sin. It's a temptation and a sin. Okay, um, the results of temptation. Let's, that's the next section, results of temptation. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. Now, temptation does this. The result... You want to use temptation well. Do you understand? You want to use temptation well. Remember the trying of your faith. Rejoice when you fall into diverse temptations. That's what the book of James said, right? 
So you want to use it well to your advantage, not just moan and groan about it and then eventually yield to it and then mess up. If you yield to it, so let's say you yield to temptation and sin, it becomes, it turns into sin. And then what happens is your testimony is weakened at the same time. You have a bad testimony. That's why your lost loved ones aren't going to get saved because they keep looking at your bad testimony. That's the reason why you're ashamed to witness to some people because you know you don't have a good testimony. That's the reason why some people are ashamed to come back to church because they are ashamed of their testimony. See that horrible result of sin if you don't overcome it. Now, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, this is pretty convicting, isn't it? I'm surprised how convicting this teaching is. Okay. <laughs> I'm just shooting off my mouth, but you might be surprised I'm getting under conviction just shooting off my mouth. My sin today is being a hypocrite. <laughs> I say all this, and then I'm like, you big hypocrite. <laughs> you know what I mean? All right, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation. But what happens? And a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in perdition. You'll notice when you fall into temptation, it traps you. It becomes sin. Notice, and in, into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Did you notice that? It becomes sin. And then your testimony is weak, weakened. Drown men in destruction and perdition. Your testimony is destroyed. But another result, if resisted, if resisted, the Lord is glorified. Amen. And then the saint becomes stronger. God gets the glory. Glory be to God. Amen. That's what God did re related to Abraham, to Job against Satan, right? See that? Job did what he could for me. Look what Abraham did. He was willing to offer his son. God wants to make a show against the devil. Glory goes more to the Lord and then what that becomes when God is glorified, you are strengthened to what? Resist other temptations. Well, I don't want to go through temptations. Well, tough. Everyone's going to go through it. It's common to man. You know why you should uh, overcome temptation, not yield? Because if you yield to this one, you're going to yield to more. If you get hurt by this one, you're going to get hurt by plenty more out there. So that's why it is worth it to grit your teeth to overcome this temptation. Why? So you can have the strength where you can be familiar with the next one and other ones. Why? To avoid as much hurt as possible. <clears throat> Another thing is that you do know is that you obeyed the Lord. Obedience is confirmed. Isn't it good to know that you followed God's will today? Uh, obedience to what am I doing? Obedience, okay. I mean, that's a wonderful thing about coming to church. That's a wonderful thing about getting rid of your sin. Why? I pleased God today. I followed God's will today. I obeyed him. When's the last time you ever had a good night's sleep and said, man, I'm glad I obeyed God today? You know what that's like? Most of us can't say that, can we? Try to make that your goal today. Try to make that your goal before you go to bed tonight that I obeyed God today. Amen. Now, John, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. See that? That ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You grow in faith and maturity. You're strengthened. Look at verse 12, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. See, God gets the glory. 
Now uh, let's talk about victory over temptations. Let's talk about victory over temptations. Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3. If you want victory against temptation, then I would write these verses down and this list down if I were you. This is probably the most important thing that you want from today's teaching. Okay, what are the victory tips that I need to know where I can conquer the temptation, where I can conquer the sins? Because it's getting a hold of my life and I'm getting sick and tired of that. Well, let's check mark these things. The faithfulness of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. The Bible says, But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. So what God does <clears throat> is that he's faithful to give you the right amount of temptation to you where you're able to pass the test. The question is, God is faithful to you, so will you do your part and be faithful to him? The problem is we're not. We don't believe he's faithful to us. And because of that, we don't take advantage. Listen, we don't take advantage of his faithfulness in our life, his faithful promise, and apply it to ourselves where we can overcome that temptation. A lot of times the reason why you mess up into temptation and sin is you're not claiming God's faithfulness using God's faithfulness on your life. Now, that's such a waste, don't you think so? Great is thy faithfulness, isn't it? Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. It's time that you claim that and use it. <clears throat> Revelation 3.10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Uh, a lot of times, though, the problem is, is that uh, when God is faithful and gets us away from the temptation or gives us the strength to conquer the temptation, we don't use it. You know, a lot of times we make ourselves deliberately open and available to temptation and sin. And that's not of God. He provided you a way out. Are you going to take it? The next one is by using the word of God. By using the word of God. Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. Uh, using the word of God is the next one. That's how you're going to get victory over temptation. Notice that the Lord Jesus Christ himself didn't think that he was powerful, macho enough to do that. He had to use God's word. So what makes you think you're better than Jesus, right? If you look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, notice the tempter against Jesus. But verse 4, Jesus said, it is written. He's quoting scripture. Notice that Satan tempts him again at verse 5 and verse 6. But at verse 7, Jesus says, it is written. He quotes scripture. Notice in verse 8 and 9, Satan tempts him again. Verse 10, Jesus says, what? It is written. It is written. Uh, do you do that? Do you quote Bible verses? You don't even memorize your verses, do you? And no wonder you're going to fall into temptation and sin. By the way, this, the, these past weeks, a lot of it has to do with conquering temptations. You know that? The memory verses. Take advantage. Uh, the other one, Luke 22, Luke chapter 22, the intercession of Christ. I like that one. The intercession of Christ. Do you realize how many times that God could have cast us off? Do you realize how many times Satan could have uh, swallowed up our lives? Do you realize how many times that Satan could have given a greater temptation? Do you realize how many times that the times that we messed up in sin, that it should have been the end of us? The only thing that's saving your life is because Jesus Christ keeps interceding on your behalf to the Father. Amen. And God keeps giving you grace and mercy upon you. Because Christ is pleading on your behalf and interceding for you. I know that Gene Kim's stupid, God, but Lord, uh, he can still do this for you. Lord, he can give you glory, and Lord, give him another chance. Ain't that wonderful? 
It ain't wonderful to you, it's wonderful to me. <laughs> Thank you, God, for giving me another chance. Luke twenty two thirty one, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Ain't that a blessing? Christ praying for you. You know, you're too weak to pray for yourself. Jesus Christ is praying for you. Ain't that something? Matthew 26, 41. Matthew 26, 41. Personal prayer. Personal prayer. So it's good that Jesus Christ prays for you, but now it's time that you pray for yourself. Why? When you pray to the Lord, it helps you to overcome temptation. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that he enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Man, I, gotta keep, I pray all the time, Lord, prevent this from happening. Lord, save me from that. And do you know how many times the Lord gives me the strength or he helps the scenario or he prevents a bad scenario from happening? If you don't pray for that first thing in the morning, you wonder why you keep yielding to temptation and sin first thing in the morning. 2 Timothy 2. Second Timothy 2. Now, this one everybody needs to work on. No one works on this, okay? You know what you need to do when temptation and sin comes? Run away. Run away. Do you know how many people just deliberately open themselves up to temptation? Well, I keep messing up. Well, I wonder if the, the sins that you're messing around with is right there with you or if it's nearby you or whenever you walk across or you go someplace, it's just right there. Run away. Amen. Second Timothy 2.22. You know why we call, we call the church as one of our haven of uh, rest and refuge? You're running away. Going to church is running away from the world and from sin. Second Timothy 2.22. The Bible says here, flee also youthful lusts. So you got to run away from sin. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. This is a very good verse here. This one was one of our memory verses. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 4, and then we'll look at verse 14. It says, don't even look at it. Don't even turn toward that direction. Proverbs 4, 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked. So don't even go there. Don't even go near it. Don't even try and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it. So don't even pass by it. Like just, if you can go far away as possible, be far away as possible. Turn from it and pass away. Take a U-turn. Problem, problem with people who keep messing up in temptation and sin is because they think they're not going to mess up in it. But how many times... Sin had a record on you a hundred times, and you still have that sick, sad thought. I'm not going, oh, I can handle it. You're sick. I don't mean that in a mean way. I meant like your mind is now in a sick condition. That's what I mean. More as a pitiful state. All right, uh, James 4, verse 7. James 4, verse 7. Resisting. That's another way. Resisting. That's how you get victory against temptation. You've got to not make the temptation attractable to you. You gotta make it. Uh, you gotta make it resistible to you. So, is it something you loathe, despise, something that you cannot compromise in? Do you have something in your life, something in your life that you say is a no? I will never do that. If you never have that in your life, your flesh is very weak and you're going to succumb. Things like that is very important to you. Something that I will never do, something that I hate, something that I, want, that I despise. If you have that, then the devil, no matter how much he attracts you, he'll always turn you away. It'll be a turn off, not a turn on. Now let's look at James 4 verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So eventually that temptation will go away if you make it, uh, if you resist it. Now remember this, Satan's not going to tempt you with something that you can resist. He's going to tempt you with something that you can't resist. See? 
That's why he, he keeps pulling up that temptation on you. So you got to make it something that's not attractable, not irresistible to you. That's very important. The last one is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We looked at that verse a million times, but the last victory is accepting the way of escape. Accepting the way of escape. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape. A way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. The question is, do you see those escape routes? Now look, the problem with us is that we don't want to take the escape route. We insist that there must be another way. You ever say that? The Lord tells you the way to go and then you go, God, there no, 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 there must be another way. When you're told, hey, I need help with this and I'm stuck with this temptation, I don't know why, I'm just so stupid, I'm so dumb, I'm just so evil. No, 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 it's because this is the right way. Now do it. Oh, no, 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 there must be another way. See, that's why. That's why. It's not because you're stupid, evil, weak, or something like that. You just don't want to take the way God told you to take, period. So the question is, what are your fire exits? Do you see them? I mean, you know what they are. So you got to look at your fire exits, see what God's shown you, told you. It's up to you if you're going to take it. And if you want to burn down with the building, then that's fine. Then your life's going to burn, right? And that's why some of you are going to go down with the building if you're not careful. But guess what? I got good news for you. The fire exit is still there. It's just up to you now if you're going to take it. But remember this, fire exits don't last forever. Okay? So you got to take it while you have the chance. So these are the victory over temptations. I hope that they've been a blessing to you, that you'll apply it, and that this lesson will be helpful. Father God, I pray that you'll dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray that we won't give in to temptation and to sin. Help us to claim victory in our life, claim victory in you. And uh, bless the fellowship, bless the break, bless the singing, preaching, and everything else we're going to do after this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.